For the record, both assistant state attorneys are present, both defense counsel and Mr. Seavers. State's ready? Yes, Your Honor. Um, just a matter of housekeeping before we bring the jury back. We had uh, introduced into evidence 64. There were pieces to it. I'm speaking with the clerk at, at the break, and we and I've talked with defense counsel. We will label what was introduced as 64 as 64A, and the two attached documents as 64B1 and B2. No objection. Uh, there are business records that renew on per, uh, prior objections. Other than the relabeling, I mean, no objection to the relabeling. Oh no, not to the relabeling. Okay. Defense is ready? Defense is ready, Your Honor. Can I have both sides approach? Okay. It's taken care of. Excellent. State's ready? Yes, Your Honor. Defense is ready? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Bring them out. Please be seated. I'll ask our jurors again, did you follow my instructions not talk about the case among yourselves with anybody else or look up any of the people or places involved? Even if you did so inadvertently, now would be the time to raise your hand and let me know. For the record, no jurors lifted their hand. Next witness. Your Honor, preliminarily the state would move to introduce state's exhibit number 59A and 59B. These have previously been shown to defense counsel. They are under a business record certification and are the records from Delta Airlines. Renewed objections? Yes, Your Honor. Noted for the record. Overruled. We'll show them admitted. May I approach the clerk? You may. At this time, Your Honor, the state calls Dr. Coyne. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Would you state your name for the record, please? Sure. Dr. Thomas Coyne. And would you spell your last name for our court reporter? Sure. C-O-Y-N-E. And Dr. Coyne, where do you work? At the District 21 Medical Examiner's Office here in Fort Myers. And what do you do at the District Medical Examiner's Office? I am currently the Deputy Chief Medical Examiner. And could you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury your background and your education to be a medical examiner? Sure, sure. Four years of college at Rutgers University, uh, followed by MD training in medical school at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. At the same time, I completed a PhD in toxicology at Rutgers University. Lastly, I did my, uh, my general pathology residency at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania, uh, subspecialty training in neuropathology at the same place, and then finally, uh, my forensic pathology training at the Miami-Dade Medical Examiner's Office. And so currently, I'm board certified in general pathology, forensic pathology, and neuropathology. So let's ask about those in just a minute. When did you first become a medical examiner? 2013. And let's talk about the differences. You, you gave three different board certifications <clears throat> yes. you have in pathology. Um, sure. First, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what pathology is, and then sure. let's talk about those different certifications. Sure. Pathology is a general specialty in medicine, much like internal medicine. And so pathology really is just generally the study of disease. Pathologists work behind the scenes, unlike physicians who see patients in their office. Pathologists work with either their microscope or other diagnostic testing to try to help diagnose disease. And so if you ever had a biopsy specimen sent off or maybe a pap smear, a pathologist is the person who's behind the scenes making that diagnosis and then working with your general physician to help try to diagnose your disease and then of course affect treatment. Um, a neuropathologist is a person who has additional specialty training in brain pathology. So all brain diseases as well as brain injury. And lastly, forensic pathology is a subspecialty of uh, pathology where we try to determine cause and manner of death. And, and essentially, a person who is a forensic pathologist has background training in all, all types of, uh, the same training a pathologist has with regards to natural disease processes, but we also have additional specialty training in injuries, and so how injuries occur, whether it be blunt trauma, sharp trauma environmental injury like fires, electrocution. Uh, we also have backgrounds in toxicology, so how toxins and poisons may affect the body, and also the process of decomposition. 
And you mentioned being board certified. Yeah. What does it take or what's involved in becoming board certified? A long exam uh, through the American Board of Pathology. So there were three separate examinations for both general pathology as well as forensic pathology and neuropathology. Now, as a medical <laughs> examiner, and you said you're the deputy medical examiner? Yes, the what, deputy chief, yes. Deputy chief. What does that entail? Um, so the medical examiners here, we have actually four doctors who currently work at our office. Uh, two are associate medical examiners, myself and the, uh, the chief, Dr. Hamilton. And all of us uh, really are tasked with trying to determine all of the uh, uh, deaths that occur in, in our county, Lee County, as well as Glaze and Hendry County, those which occur suddenly or unexpectedly, those who occur via trauma, uh, overdose deaths. Um, our job is to use our pathology training to help determine, like I said, both cause and manner of death. And as a, as a medical examiner, do you perform autopsies? I do. And about how many autopsies have you performed? Right now, it's probably approaching 1,300 autopsies. And what's the purpose of an autopsy? <clears throat> an autopsy uh, proceeds much like uh, an examination of a patient in an office, um, the, the goal of which is, is to, in the end, determine why this person died. Um, and I can talk about how an autopsy proceeds, if you'd like. Um, yep. So, yes. ag again, as I mentioned, it's just like um, an examination in an office. It begins by looking at the person externally, you know, from what were they wearing to what is their body height, weight, eye color, and then, of course, looking for any evidence of natural disease on the outside that may clue me into what I may find on the inside. Uh, in addition, we can also look for signs of injury. Um, after we do our external examination, we begin with an internal examination where we examine both the head as well as the chest and abdomen for all the organ systems. Again, looking for natural disease processes and, of course, for injury. Hopefully there we'll have an idea why a person died, but if not, then we can go a little further and use either biopsy specimens to look under the microscope for disease. We could do special testing for infections like cultures or toxicology testing as well. And collectively, all those results come together and help us synthesize both the cause and manner of death. Now, when you say cause of death, what are you referring to <clears throat> with cause of death? Sure. I can... Begin first with manner because I think, I think it's a little bit easier to understand. So in Florida, there are five um, manners of death. So first is natural, which when a person dies of a natural disease. Second being accident, which is very broad, which encompasses those who, like say, die of a, a car accident or injuries sustained in a car accident. Uh, it even covers drug overdose deaths. Uh, suicide, uh, which is self-explanatory. Uh, homicide, where a person dies directly as a result of the hands of another. Um, and lastly, undetermined, where despite all efforts, we were not able to determine the manner of death. Um, cause of death is what really led that person to die in that moment. And so if I use the example of a person who, let's say, died of a heart attack, uh, their cause of death may very well be a heart attack or myocardial infarction, which is a medical term, due to atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, which is a disease of the blood vessels of the heart. And their manner of death will be natural. Whereas, let's say a person had skull fractures due to a car accident, their cause of death may read blunt head trauma, and their manner of death may be accident. And that's how you differentiate the two. Now, in 2015, the very end of 2015, did you have an occasion to perform an autopsy on a person uh, named Teresa Sievers? I did. And would you describe to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how Teresa <clears throat> Sievers' body was presented to you? Sure. It came into our office uh, in a body bag, and that body bag was uh, sealed with a lock. And so the autopsy procedure first began by unlocking that body bag and opening the body bag where we examined um, her in the, in, the, in the same state in which she was found. That is clothed, uh, wearing <clears throat> a dress, and with our transport sheet. And so we begin by photographing the body as is in the bag with clothing on, and then carefully removing the clothing. Um, putting it aside for evidence purposes as well as taking photos of the clothing. At that time, we may begin to obtain evidence from the body as necessary. So, for instance, a sexual assault kit may be obtained then, uh, fingernail clippings or fingernail swabs, cultures for, uh, for looking for infectious disease. Uh, after that and all the photos are taken, uh, the body is cleaned, clean photos are taken, and then we can begin looking for injury. So essentially, after we remove any, any uh, clothing or blood that may be on the body, we can look for injury and disease. And so you indicated photos were taken of, <clears throat> Therese, of a victim. So photos were taken of Teresa Sievers after her clothes were removed <clears throat> and 
any blood was uh, cleaned from her. Is that correct? Yes, um, and and throughout the autopsy procedure as well. So we stop and take photos of anything that is um, of importance. Now, did you take photos of Teresa Sievers with her hair when it was on her head? Yes, we did. Did you also, was her head shaved? Yes, yes, we have to. Yes. Is that standard procedure in every autopsy? Not every autopsy, but in autopsies where you have injuries to the scalp, it allows us to visualize the actual injury. Um, in this case, there were many injuries that were underneath the hair, so we had to remove that hair in order to better characterize those injuries. You also talked about sexual assault kits. When you conducted the autopsy of Teresa Sievers, did you check all areas of her body, including her genitalia, to see whether there was any indication of a sexual assault? Yes, we did. And what were your findings? I saw no evidence of a sexual assault. Now, I want to show you what, have been, what has been marked for evidence as States Exhibits 115A through K. They were previously shown to defense counsel. Sure. And I'd like you to look through those, and then when you're done looking, I'll ask you some questions. Sure. Are those photos that were taken during various stages of the autopsy of Teresa Sievers? Yes. And do those photos fairly and accurately reflect what was being photographed at the time during the autopsy? Yes. Moved to introduce States Exhibits 115A through K. And Your Honor, my objection is 403. And both sides approve. Ready. For the record, the objections noted for the record overruled will show the <laughs> items admitted. As we, as uh, I want to talk a little bit about what states exhibits 115A through K are, but I'd like to talk about how with Teresa Sievers, um, some of the, starting with, I think, states exhibit uh, 115A, but if you could talk with the jury initially about how you conducted the autopsy of Teresa Sievers, and then I'm going to ask you without at this point showing the photos to the jury to discuss what those various photos indicate. But if you could start by talking about, in terms of these photos, um, the process, how you uh, prepared Teresa Sievers' body, and then how you began your uh, autopsy. Sure. Uh as I mentioned previously, once we opened the bag and had removed the clothing and obtained um, uh, samples for evidence, uh, we started the process of, of uh, cleaning the body because it was, it was obvious that there were multiple injuries on the head at that moment in time. In order for us to better visualize them, we had to sort of remove away a lot of the, the dry blood that was present on the head and scalp. Um, and so uh, the first photo uh, that I have here shows um, her, her forehead and nose, and you can see that there are uh, several uh, lacerations there consistent with blunt trauma, blunt impact trauma to the head and face. Um, and so we realized at that point in time that there were further injuries underneath the hair, and so it was uh, important for us to proceed with shaving the hair. So and as we did, we noticed. For a moment. I'm sorry. The photo that you're referring to right now is that 115A. That's correct. Thank you. Please continue sure. that. Sure. And. Um, we started to uh, shave the top and side of the hair, which was around uh, several of the lacerations or impact trauma, excuse me, that was on the forehead. Uh, and I began to realize that there was uh, lacerations or impact trauma on the top of the head, on the left side of the head, as well as in the back of the head. And so we had to take the hair off from all sides, actually better visualize all those injuries. And then it became obvious that there were multiple blunt impact injuries. Uh, palpating those injuries, I was able to uh, feel fractures underneath them or depressed skull fractures. And so the way we proceeded at that point was to just begin systematically going from injury to injury, uh, characterizing that injury, uh, measuring the injury, and taking photographs of those injuries. And you used the word palpitate. What does that 
So sure, exactly. the palate is just, just essentially use your finger, much like you would um, on a patient in an exam room, um, because here obviously the scalp is covered with skin. I can see a, a laceration or a tear in the skin, but by feeling around there, I can feel for fracturing underneath. So I can feel the fractures of the skull. And um, I want to go back just a moment to 115A and 115B, where we see a uh, trauma to the nose area. Can you discuss with the members of the jury what you found in terms of the trauma to the nose area? So on the right side of the nose, um, just, I guess, inferior medial to the eye, uh, there are two small curved lacerations that if you connect them together, will almost kind of form a circle. Uh, and that whole area is bruised, and underneath there you can feel what I call a comminuted fracture, meaning the bones in this area are shattered almost like puzzle pieces. Um, and that's consistent with a, a blunt impact from a, a small object directly to the nose and sort of cheek area, if you will. Um, and then, of course, above that, um, on the forehead, there are three lacerations, um, and then looking to immediately to the right and the left, there are three additional lacerations. All of them are very similar in size. They have sort of a semicircular shape to them, uh, indicating a small object with a, a round striking surface. And underneath those lacerations were, again, as I mentioned, those, those skull fractures. I want to talk for a minute about primary and secondary injuries. Again, referring back to the nose. <clears throat> What are primary injuries and what are secondary injuries? Sure, an injury um, that is primary is directly related to the actual uh, injury itself or the object causing the actual injury. Um, secondary injuries are really a broad topic, but taking head trauma, for instance, we know, of course, when a person gets, let's say, hit in the head with a bat, just using this object, and it creates a fracturing of the skull, and it may also cause some bleeding on the inside of the skull. That's the primary injury, but over time, that wound may actually um, uh, swell. The brain itself may very well swell, and the swelling of the brain inside the skull is dangerous because it has nowhere to go. So that swelling is directed, the force of that swelling is directed inward, and that could be um, uh, fatal. And so that's really the secondary injury. But another category of secondary injury incurs the actual injury itself. And so in the process of committing a primary injury, let's say I'm, I'm hitting the skull with a flat object, like a, like a shovel, for instance. When the shovel strikes the skull at the impact site, the, the skull is, is a bone, so it's not plastic. It will bend inward, and then distant from that inward bending will be an outward bending that will create a fracturing of the skull distant from the actual impact site. And that can also cause tearing of the skin around that secondary to the fracture of the skull. So those are secondary injuries that occur around that primary injury. Um, in this case, though, uh, I know that they, all of these objects, or excuse me, all of the injuries were created by a, an object with a smaller surface area because I have depressed skull fractures. And so there isn't that, when the, when the bone bend, bends inward, because all of that force is um, directed to a small surface or a small surface area, that inward bending causes fracturing at that site without that distal fracturing. Um, so for instance, the nose, another example, I know that this is a primary injury because I have a comminuted fracture or shattering of the bone. That doesn't occur secondarily. That occurs from direct impact. And so there are two ways of looking at primary and secondary injury. Um, I want to move on to some of the other photos that you have uh, which show some of the injuries to the skull. Sure. Perhaps we can move on to 115 um, D. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> So um, looking at 115D, uh, it's a, a photograph taken just behind the right ear. Uh, so you can see what is really the occipital scalp or back of the scalp or back of the head for that matter. Uh, and of course the ear, the top of the ear is bruised and directly behind it is a small laceration. And just lateral, I'm pointing to the back of my head, just lateral to that, there's a much larger laceration. And it's clear to see that uh, peering through that laceration, the skull has been fractured, and you can actually see visible brain, and the brain matter has been uh, pulpified or, or fragmented. And can you tell us what we are looking at in photo E, 115E? Sure. So 115E is a photograph now um, of the back of the head. Uh, and you can see uh, in this picture, the right ear, there's a towel on the left side of the head 
covering the left ear. Uh, and you can see uh, that large uh, open laceration I just referred to, uh, in addition to what looks like three additional lacerations and a large uh, abrasion or abraded bruise on the top of the scalp. And um, finally, at this point, could you just describe for us what we see in 115G? Okay. Now, 115G uh, is, a, again, a photograph now just zooming in on that large laceration on the back of the head. Um, and looking at this, uh, looking at the, the borders of the actual wound itself and then the skull beneath, it looks like this is probably a, a composite of several different impacts within one uh, small area uh, with you know, associated depressed skull fractures and then, of course, the injury directly to the brain itself. Were you able, as you were doing the autopsy, to make a determination as to whether there was blunt force trauma or a blunt impact, <clears throat> and if so, a number of separate impacts? I think the, uh, if you minimally, there's probably about 17 impacts here to the head itself. Um, that's just a guess based upon the number of injuries and a minimal number of, say, composite uh, strikes in this one area. Um, that's what I uh, surmised from my, um, my examination. Now, when you were obser observing the wounds to Teresa Sievers, did there seem to be some wounds that were had a greater impact when they struck the skull or the head than other wounds? Yes, uh, I do think that the, the wound I just described in the back of the head uh, had a greater impact. If I uh, would guess based upon the evidence here that this was probably uh, when the uh, when the head was fixed, so I would assume that uh, she had uh, collapsed to the ground at this point in time, that the head was fixed against a, a non-yielding surface, uh, because the, the 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 injuries here are, are pretty severe. Uh, there are linear fractures um, that extend from this wound to the base of the skull, and there's also what we call a, a hinge fracture across the base of the skull, and so uh, not uh, not the you know, describe horrifying details here, but if, if you remove the, the brain from the skull, the base of the skull, uh, you could bend almost like a hinge. In other words, it was fractured completely across. And that's the kind of injury I, I very commonly see in, in car crashes uh, from a lateral impact with a great force. Uh, so I think here uh, the head was fixed because it was, it was, it was uh, receiving a, gr a much greater force. Uh, you know, it wasn't able to move. It was fixed in place, so all that force is being directed to the back of the skull. And is that what we're seeing in the photo that's 115K, Exhibit 115K? Sure. Yes. So 115K is now a photograph of the skull base after the brain is removed, and you can see that hinge fracture that courses across the base of the skull. Um, <clears throat> this also courses across through an area of the brain that is adjacent to our, our brain stem. The brain stem is the sort of center part of our our brain that really controls cardiorespiratory function also controls wakefulness. And so uh, injury to this part of the brain uh, is fatal. It can put a person into neurogenic shock. Uh, they most certainly would have lost consciousness almost immediately. Um, and then in addition, uh, there were little small hemorrhages throughout the brain uh, that um, told me that there was severe brain trauma as well, brain injury from, from the force of these impacts. And are we talking, are you, re, as you're referencing and looking down, is that State's Exhibit 115K to which you're looking? Yes. Or is it? Yes. Now, what I would like to ask you to do is step down for a moment and with the court's permission um, and show the jury some of these photos that we've been discussing. Yes, ma'am. Counsel, you can move if you need to. <laughs> Dr. Corn, if you would step down, I'm going to sure. hand you these photos, and if you could describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what they are seeing in each of these photos as I hand them to you. I'm going to start with State's Exhibit 115A. If you could tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury 
what they're seeing and what your findings were. So, this is now. Okay, hold, hold on a second, doctor. Why don't we have you move a little closer? That's probably a better idea. My apologies. Ready? So, in this photo, in this photo, as I was mentioning, uh, this is a picture of the decedent laying on the autopsy table. This is now the right side of her face. And you can see here in this photo was the injury of the nose that I referred to previously, the two lacerations which combine almost to make a semicircle, the bruise underneath which there were those palpable comminuted fractures. Right here on the forehead, you can see on the right side of the forehead, there are three lacerations. This almost looks like there are two separate impacts together which form one larger laceration. And in addition, this laceration. I'm going to hand you what's been in, introduced into evidence is 115 feet. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what they're seeing there and what your findings were? So in 115 B now we're looking at the, the face uh, from above it. The hair has been shaved. And so now you can see all of these wounds on the top of the head, both the right side as well as the left side. Uh, all of them have that sort of somewhat semicircular shape. This is the, the lacerations underneath which were palpable fractures. Um, we can begin to see some of the other ones that are not visible in this photo. One I want to hand you now 115C. 115C now uh, is a view standing in front of the head. So you can see here's the top of the head. The nose okay. is on Dr. the top. Dr. can you just make oh, sure that all Jews sure, sure. So here is the picture of the top of the head. Uh, the nose here is at the 12 o'clock position. Um, these lacerations you saw previously on that, on those other two photos, um, 115 A and B, you can also see the nose injury here. But now, additionally, we have these other lacerations, which are now visual, visible, excuse me, at the top of the stomach. And did those injuries that you're showing, did they go around the skull? Yes. So, so there were injuries on all sides of the skull. Uh, the one, uh, the ones that you can't see here, excuse me, the ones that are on the back of the uh, scalp, which the large one, which is covered up here by the towel. And if I hand you uh, State's Exhibit 115B, you were just, <coughs> I want you to hold that at the same time. You were talking about how you can see some of these in this picture as well. Can you let the sure. jury know what? So here is the, the nose injury. You can see these lacerations over here. This one is sort of tucked away in this photo. You need to see these two here. What you're missing in this photo is the additional one right here. Okay. I want to hand you now 115G. And if you could tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what they're seeing in 115G. So this is now a photograph of the back of the head. The right side, here is the right ear. And so you can see first here, this is an impact to the top of the ear with a small little laceration behind the ear. And then you have this large laceration here, which as I mentioned previously, is probably a composite of multiple impacts to one general area. And you can see here, this is brain material uh, that is visible through that wound. So this, the, the skull in here has been fragmented. Some of the pieces of skull have actually been driven into the brain itself. This little tear here is what we have referred to previously as a secondary injury where the actual fracturing of the skull caused a laceration of the skin itself from the, in, from the inside out. In addition, you have another impact site just above this and uh, one posterior to that as well. When we look at uh, states 115G and we see an impact site here that you just pointed to, could one impact have created all of what we see as the large wound? No, this is several impacts. And again, I think it's also with the head in fixed position. And then as I described that fracture previously, the hinge fracture. The hinge fracture courses from just behind the ear across the other side uh, to the, towards the left ear. And then there are multiple other linear fractures that course downward uh, towards the base of the skull from this downward. I just want to hand you for a minute 115B. And just on that, can you just from what point the hinge fracture started and where it So, as I mentioned, it was, of course, from behind the right ear 
across the base of the skull, which is just above the eyes, towards the left side. Now, when you were conducting your autopsy of Teresa Severs, did you notice bruising on her arms and wrists area? She did. She did. Yeah, she, she had bruises on the arms. Um, you take a look at the flexor aspect, the area of the wrist as well. Front. I want to show you States Exhibits 115H, I, and J. Let me start. I don't. Let me start with 115H. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what they're seeing in 115H? So this is the right hand. Um, actually, I apologize, but I don't see the thumb here. So this will be the left hand, and you'll see there is a bruise right here, which is sort of on the pinky side of the wrist, just behind the, the wrist. And then kind of peeking out of the, the photo up here is an additional bruise on the floor where I'm pointing out my arm right now. Yeah, I think, Dr. Point, not all of our jurors can see Oh, it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So here is, again, as I said, here is the thumb. This is the left hand. There is a bruise right here just behind the wrist bone, and there's an additional bruise on the top of the forearm right here. To the jurors at this end seat. And let me show you 115i, and can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what they're seeing in 115i? This is now the, the, the flexor part of the forearm, which this will be more sort of in the middle of the forearm, where I'm pointing on my arm right now. And you can see that bruise. With a round bruise approximately two inches in size. Now I also two I want to show you now 115J. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what they're seeing in 115J? This is another photograph of the flex flexure part of the forearm, uh, the flexor portion. You can see there are several bruises, four in particular. Point at them right now. All of them are approximately the same size, about two centimeters from their rounded. And those bruises, are they often what we might refer to as to giving the appearance of defensive wounds? They're in, they're in an area of the body uh, where we would call them defensive wounds because if you can imagine a person who is being attacked, who's trying to parry a blow or defend themselves, but then they protect their head, often pull up their arms. And so you get uh, injuries to the what we call the flexor compartment of the forearm. Oh, or even sometimes the back of the forearm. And I don't know if you can, you were talking about the size of those particular bruises. Would they be of a same <laughs> size that you might see from the head of a hammer? They, they were all uh, about two centimeters in, in, in diameter, uh, close in approximation to the wounds on the head, close in approximation to the diameter of the head of a claw. Thank you. You could resume your seat. Oh, let me help you. I got that. Dr. if two people were hit in the same place with the same instrument and the same force, if that were even possible to do something that precise, <clears throat> would the external manifestation of that injury be identical on both people? No, they wouldn't. Um, there was uh, considerable inter-individual differences, um, especially with injuries to the skin. Um, age has a has a big factor to uh, play in there with with the elasticity of our skin. But all of our uh, skin is under a considerable amount of tension. Uh, we call them Langer lines and, and medicine. It has to do with the connective tissue under our skin that maintains the skin in, in, in certain uh, tension. And it depends upon how the skin kind of curves around the body. So as you can imagine, skin curving around the, my, my head, uh, the contours of my head, maybe around my knee, would be in a little more tension than skin, let's say, on my chest or my abdomen. And that <clears throat> is important because if I have a, a blunt impact to, let's say, a part of my body which is under a little more tension, uh, when the, the skin tears, it will, it will create a larger wound, so this, the, the skin may pull open. And that's why head wounds bleed a little more, because uh, they do tend to open up because of the tension of the skin around contours of the skull. It keeps the wound open, allows it to bleed a little more. 
Um, and so, so depending upon where a person is hit, they may be hit with the same object with the same force, but depending upon where in the body they're hit, that wound may look different. Also, as we age, we lose the collagen in our skin, the elasticity of our skin. So an older person's skin is a little more fragile, may tear a little more, may bruise a little more easier. Persons are also on different medications, which can affect how we respond to injury. And so there, there is a lot of inter-individual difference in injuries. Were every single one of the wounds you saw on, do, on Dr. Teresa Sievers, <clears throat> were every single one of those wounds a fatal wound? What no. you would call a fatal wound? No, they're not, no. Um, did you um, determine a cause of death for I Teresa did. Sievers? And what did you determine the cause of death to be? Uh, blunt head trauma. I want to show you what's been marked for identification as States Exhibit 116, <clears throat> previously shown to Defense Counsel. And ask you if you can tell me what 116 is. This is a certificate of death for the state of Florida. And uh, is that a uh, certificate of death that you complete that you completed in this particular case? Yes. And is that the certificate of death for Teresa Sievers? Yes. Uh, moved to introduce states exhibit 116. No objection. Show it admitted. I also want to show you what is in evidence is state's exhibit number one um, and ask you uh, if this is Teresa Sievers, the individual on whom you performed the autopsy uh, back the end of June of 2015 and for whom you issued the death certificate. certificate yes. Of death. Yes, it was. Thank you very much. Tender the witness. Thank you. Good afternoon, Good Doctor. Afternoon. How are you? Let me start you had indicated that the strikes all came from the head portion of a claw hammer. Is that correct, sir? It looked that way. Okay. Um, and uh, I take it you are also familiar with what's called the ball-peen hammer, is that yes. correct? Um, there were no apparent injuries from uh, what would be considered a ball-peen hammer, correct? It's, it's difficult for me to say because most hammers, uh, the, the head of the hammer, uh, mm -hmm. have about uh, a similar size in terms of their, their diameter. So it's hard sometimes to tell the class of the hammer that's used in creating an injury uh, when, when, when you're using the head of the hammer. So, okay. for instance, a ball peen hammer, the, the peen portion is rounded, yes. would create an injury that probably looks a little different. Uh, the claw portion of the hammer, if that was used to strike, would create a characteristic injury. But the head of the hammer, it's hard for me to tell um, what hammer was used. Well, let me ask you, uh, speaking of the claw portion of the hammer, if the uh, claw portion of the hammer were to be used, yeah. that would make a distinctive wound, correct? Yes, it would. Um, and... Um, as you're aware, a claw hammer has two protrusions that are used to pry out a nail, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And so, um, depending on the, the angle of the strike, you would expect to either um, see one or pot potentially two um, that's, that's protrusions. That's correct. It would, almost, it would almost look like a puncture wound um, because the, the, the edge of the claw comes down to a fine point almost. And so you, you tend to get uh, two uh, adjacently spaced uh, almost a, you know, transverse wounds. Um, and also, uh, when it strikes the skull, the fracture is a little different, too. Sometimes you'll see two, two uh, almost puncture wounds in the skull. And when we, when we think of striking wounds in a vacuum, we tend to think mm -hmm. that every strike is perfectly perpendicular. Yeah. In practice, is that usually the case? <clears throat> no, that is not the case. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and typically, uh, there are glancing blows or, or mm -hmm. angled blows, uh, and would that account for um, the crescent-shaped wounds? Yeah, so, uh, well, when most persons uh, strike with the hammer, I mean, in theory, you know, you should use most of your wrist and strike with the flat uh, portion of the, of the head of the hammer if you're driving a nail into a surface. Um, but many of us sort of come downward, and so, yes, we'll strike with one edge of that head as composed to the whole flat face. And um, 
And doctor, you've you've had uh, several um, several autopsies you've performed where the decedent was killed with a hammer, correct? Yes, that's correct. How many to date have you performed? Where with a hammer, hammer? I, I've I've worked on three cases. Okay. Where they use a hammer, um, I've had tons of uh, blunt head trauma with various objects, but three with a hammer. And would I be correct in saying that every individual has a different and distinct way of swinging a hammer? It's most likely true. Yeah. Okay. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, th typically when you're driving a nail, you want to drive yeah. from the wrist. Yep, from the elbow um, and wrist. Yeah. But there, <clears throat> there is some, some elbow, and, and even to some extent, if, if you're really thrusting, there would be some shoulder involvement. Is that correct? Shoulder, uh, as well as the torso, core muscles, things of that nature. Yeah. And, um, and part of the, tell me if you agree with me, this, mm -hmm. uh, basic physics says um, that uh, force is mass times acceleration. Mm -hmm. And the way a hammer accelerates is typically in an arc if it's with a swing. Is that correct? <clears throat> yes, depending upon who's swinging it, but yes. Usually there, there is an arc to it, especially um, if a person is swinging that hammer. Okay. And if we're using an arc that mm -hmm. puts our body in, in kind of the position of using our arms like a lever, mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Sure. Okay. And would you further agree that the longer your arm, the more power you can generate on a centrifugal type of swing. True, and also in this case, you know, it's also muscularity too. We're talking about the ability to uh, accelerate that, that weight through space. And so a person who uh, also has greater muscle mass, uh, greater nerve conduction velocity can move that weight through space. Uh, that would also increase, you know, the, the force just based upon that simple equation you mentioned. And you talked about the difference between a strike from a non-fixed uh, position mm -hmm. versus uh, when an object is up against a fixed surface. Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so, doctor, if I were to pull the board in yeah. my hand and try and hammer a nail into yeah. the board that I'm holding, would that be easier or more difficult than if I sat the board down on something? Much more difficult. Okay. Um, and further, and I know you, you did the autopsy, mm -hmm. but on your educated guess, would that fixed position be the ground? Objection, Your Honor, as to the question, I think it's ambiguous. Are we talking about the sample board on the podium? Are we talking about the autopsy? Hold on, counsel rephrase. Thank you. In, during the autopsy, <clears throat> Was it your educated <clears throat> guess, your belief, that the fixed position was most likely uh, Dr. Seaver's head while she was face down on the floor? It would be my assumption, uh, yes. Although, uh, you know, I, I can't say it wasn't up against the wall or, you know, but, but uh, okay. my opinion would be yeah, based okay. upon you know, the scene. And you also said that the, um, the, the major contusion, was this the... Uh, Occipital lobe right back here? Well, the occipital lobe is, yeah, in the back of the head. Okay. Um, and the major uh, contusion to the occipital lobe, you said that was the product of multiple strikes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and is it likely that when we, see, mm -hmm. when we see the photos, the first couple we see that the strikes are spread out all, all around the scalp? Yes. Do you account some of that some of that, I guess, disparity or some of that inaccuracy due to movement? Sure. Okay. It's quite possible, yeah. I mean, uh, whenever a person is getting uh, struck, whether it be shot at with a, with a gun or even uh, struck with a blunt object, uh, a body tends to be a body in motion. Okay. And um, is it also fair to say that when, the, um, when we see the, the major wound in the back mm -hmm. of the head, we see, I don't want to call them precise blows, mm -hmm. but we have... <clears throat> blows that are, are very close in, in where they landed. Yes. Okay. Um, did you see any evidence that the claw portion of the hammer was used to inflict any of the blows in the occipital lobe? I did not. Okay. Um, and so, doctor, is it your opinion that the, the, the brain matter, uh, and, and I 
apologize if I'm getting graphic here. Yeah, sure. um, but that brain matter started to protrude through the skull during the assault. Most likely, uh, the, there, there wasn't, um, well, so even after a person dies, um, you will still have some, some uh, swelling that occurs in the brain. I mean, although the, the heart may stop beating, uh, cellular processes still occur. Uh, and so maintaining a volume within a cell still changes. And so you, you will have some changes. And so uh, when, you, when you have now uh, a void, meaning the hole in the skull, the brain can, can move into that. And even during the process of, of the attack, or if, you know, let's say if the person uh, was still alive for a minute afterwards, you may get a little bit of a, a DMAR swelling. Uh, but I do think that uh, the brain material was coming out as a result of the actual uh, the impact trauma because, as I mentioned over there, you have some skull fragments that were pushed into the actual brain matter themselves. And so that was causing small fragmentation and tearing of the brain and allowing it to sort of come free from, from its normal position. And, sir, if, if we have an object, in this case it would be a hammer, mm -hmm. coming down into that brain matter, yeah. you, um, you're generally uh, aware of what we call displacement, is that correct? Yeah. What's displacement? Well, I mean, you know, if, if, for instance, in a, in a water, if you have a bucket filled with water and you, and you place a ball in that water, you have to account for the, the volume of that ball. And so an equal amount of water, you know, consistent with the volume of the ball will be displaced out of that bucket. Okay. So the, the, the brain is no different, um, but it's a little bit different than this displacement. You know, the, the brain itself isn't fixed really inside the skull. The brain moves. Um, we have a thin space that surrounds the brain, uh, and that allows the brain to move ever so subtly within the head. During trauma, what happens is, is you have linear motion of the brain uh, because the force for instance, hitting the back of the brain will cause the brain to move forward, to slam it to the front of the skull, and an equal and opposite force will cause the brain to come back, and you have rotational movement also around the axis of the brain stem. And, and that process you, write, uh, you described right there, is that what we would typically think of when a concussion happens? Yes. Okay. Um, but going back to what I was talking about earlier, when, when the hammer would have been mm -hmm. driven down into the skull, mm -hmm it would have had to have displaced some brain matter, correct? Sure. And when it is pulled back out for another swing, that, that matter had to go somewhere, is that correct? Well, um, sure, I mean, you, you can see in the picture that there is brain matter outside of the, the wound itself on the actual skin. Um, but when I looked at that too, there was also um, transport of the body. There is also, don't forget that you know that area is kind of, it's covered in hair too. Um, and when the, when the hammer striking, um, yeah, it's it's driving in. It very well could pick up transfer. I don't know if it if it did or didn't, but it's quite possible that it could. Okay. And uh, hold on, just a second, doctor. The um. In your, in your experience, a hammer is most typically a weapon of convenience, is that correct? Objection as to relevancy and objection outside the scope of this witness's knowledge. Overruled. Doctor, uh, I'm sorry, um, I'm going to ask that again. Sure. In your experience, a hammer is most often a weapon of convenience, is that correct? In the cases I, I have performed, it was, yes. Okay. Um, and would you say that a hammer is an efficient way of effectuating the death of a human being? If, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it can deliver a significant injury. Okay. If, if delivered the correct way, is that correct? That's correct. And, um, and so, we, we talked about this area here in the back of the skull. Mm -hmm. We called it the occipital lobe, is that correct? Yeah, it's, uh, actually the, the injury kind of spanned both the parietal and occipital lobe to be specific, but yeah, it was. Okay, and, um, and, and so this, this part of the brain uh, back here, mm -hmm. just above our spinal cord, what's that part called? The part of the brain just above the spinal cord? Yeah. 
Well, it's, it's the brain stem that you're referring to. Um, and up above that, though, just up above that. You have the diencephalon, which is uh, the, the diencephalon, which is really the, the structure that um, you know is comprised of the deep nuclei of the brain that's surrounded by white matter that creates the lobes of the brain, so parietal and occipital lobes. And um, what portion of the brain controls most of our involuntary bodily functions? Brainstem. Okay, right back here. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of motor programs that coordinate through various areas of our brain. Uh, I, I mentioned the diencephalon, things that we don't, things that allow us to operate uh, sort of without having to think about it. Uh, you know, I'm sure you, many of you guys have driven to work and forgot you even drove to work. So there are many areas of the brain <clears throat> that actually can take on involuntary function, learn involuntary function. Well, let, let me ask but you this. You're, you're referring to specifically like breathing and... Right now, do you have a belief that your liver is working? Yes. Okay. I hope Are so. you thinking about your liver working mm. right now? No, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> given, given what you uh, mm. saw, can you tell me, from the photographs, from your examination, how many assailants attacked Dr. Sievers? I cannot. Okay. Um, Dr. Can, can you definitively say that there was more than one hammer used? I cannot. And doctor, you said um, you came up with a number of 17 impacts, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, and doctor, I, I don't think we ever asked this. When exactly, what date did you perform this autopsy? June 30th, 2015. June I'm sorry? June 30th, 2015. June 30th, 2015. That's correct. Okay. Um, and when you, when you uh, conduct your, auto mm. your autopsies, are, are you, um, you're photographing, you're documenting? Yes. And, and you're also communicating with law enforcement, is that I correct? Am. Yes. talked about primary versus secondary injuries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and doctor, most of the <clears throat> observable injuries in these photographs were, would you agree with me, they were the primary injuries? Yes. Okay. Um, what, if any, secondary injuries did you notice? Minimal. Uh, just for instance, uh, I pointed to a tear or a laceration on the, uh, the occipital scalp which was adjacent to that large uh, laceration and fracture that I think occurred due to fracturing of the, of the bone and then tearing of the skin. Okay. Uh, but most of all the injuries were, were primary, as far as I can tell. Did any of the secondary injuries contradict or, or tend to be, um, I, I, I guess, antagonistic or in opposition to uh, this idea that one hammer was used? No. Okay. And from your autopsy, is it possible for, for you to tell us how tall the assailants were, how much the assailants weighed? <clears throat> no. Okay. Um, Dr. Coyne, thank you so much. Thank you. State. Just briefly, Your Honor. Dr. Coyne, the secondary injuries didn't contradict the idea that two hammers were used either, did they? No, did not. In fact, the injuries don't give you any insight as to whether it's one hammer, two hammer, or five hammers that were used. No, it doesn't. Would you spell for our court reporter diencephalon? Diencephalon, sure. D-I-E-N. 
C-E-P-H-A-L-O-N. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I have nothing further. Anything further defense? No, Your Honor. Is this witness to be retained or released? Witness to be released, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Cole may be released. Oh, thank, thank you, you Doctor. You're free to go. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Exhibits 115A through which have been introduced into evidence to our clerk. And at this point, Your Honor, the state having confirmed with the clerk the introduction of its exhibits, the state rests. State having rested, there's a few matters we have to take care of outside of your presence. I'm going to instruct you still, even at this point, not to discuss the case among yourselves or with anybody else or look up any of the people or places involved, and we'll be with you momentarily. Please be seated. Motions. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to make a motion for judgment of acquittal uh, as to both first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Uh, I want to address each one. Uh, there is some overlap, but there is uh, one, uh, one specific argument that I am going to make with respect to conspiracy to commit murder. And, um, Your Honor, I suppose I'll just I'll start there. Um, Your Honor, the indictment for the conspiracy to commit murder, uh, as, as Your Honor read to the jury, stated that Mark Seavers and Jimmy Rogers and Curtis Wright confederated um, with one another. And it was pled in the conjunctive, meaning and, as opposed to the disjunctive, which is or. So, Your Honor, we have to then, hold on just a second. I'm going to direct the court to Florida Statute 775.021, Rules of Construction. And the Rules of Construction, which is a codified version of the Rule of Lenity, states that the provisions of this code and offenses defined by other statutes shall be strictly construed when the language is susceptible of differing constructions. It shall be construed most favorably to the accused. And, Your Honor, um, in looking at Mara v. State at 90, uh, set, I'm sorry, 970 Southern 2nd, uh, 475 uh, Florida 50 CA 2007, and Demus, D-E-M-U-S v. Florida. Um, and, Your Honor, with this one, it is, um, it's at number 4D17-3497. This is a fourth DCA case um, from 2019. And, Your Honor, it has not officially been published. However, my review of the uh, fourth DCA uh, <clears throat> opinions shows that a mandate was issued on or about November 1st of 2019 in this case, making, uh, making this a final order. And so although it doesn't have a, um, a recording number, Your Honor, this, this is a final order and um, mandate has been issued uh, as of um, November 1st. And Your Honor, these both tend to say that when we look at the words of an information, or in this case, an indictment, we must construe it literally. And in that, this conspiracy was completely pled in the conjunctive. We have heard no evidence that Mark Seavers in any way conspired with Jimmy Ray Rogers, or that Jimmy Ray Rogers conspired with Mark Seavers. If we take everything that the state has presented at face value, without weighing the evidence, the Curtis Wainwright said, no, I never told Mark 
about Jimmy, and Jimmy only kind of found out about Mark. Accordingly, Your Honor, the, a JOA or a judgment of acquittal must be granted in, in that the, the indictment came down in that in order to get past an argument for judgment of acquittal, in order to put on a prima facie case, Mark Seavers must have conspired with Jimmy Ray Rogers in addition to Curtis Wayne Wright, which didn't happen. Now, moving on to both cases, Your Honor, um, I'm invoking the circumstantial evidence rule. The only, the only evidence, the only <clears throat> direct evidence that we have that there was any conspiracy and that Mr. Sievers was in any way or shape or manner involved came from Curtis Wainwright. Mr. Wright, a five-time convicted felon who was offered um, an advantageous plea deal who has had multiple inconsistent statements and he himself got up there and said that he lied on several occasions in this case is of no value, Your mm -hmm. Honor. Um, this, this person is, is making self-serving statements at best. Um, there is insufficient substantial, competent evidence to convict Mr. Sievers of either the conspiracy to commit a first degree murder or in fact the first degree murder itself. I understand that this was pled under the principal theory, but when we review the witnesses We've, we've heard two separate witnesses speak about taking a Hyundai Elantra from Arizona to Florida. We've heard witnesses talk about Mr. Wright and Mr. Rogers' cell phone use. We have heard evidence of, um, of, of shopping at Walmart uh, and, and going to a racetrack in a Circle K. Um, we have heard that this, um, this murder was created um, or done with hammers uh, just now by um, Dr. Coyne, who, well, well, he didn't say it was done with the hammers. He said it was consistent with um, that manner. Um, actually, the manner would be a homicide, but the cause of death would be uh, a blunt force uh, trauma via hammer. Um, and so when we talk about competent testimony or competent evidence, Your Honor, we, we're, we're at a loss in this case. We do not have competent evidence. We have self-serving evidence. We don't have competent evidence. The, and I, I keep going back to this, Judge, the, the only evidence, the only evidence of a conspiracy came from the lips of Curtis Wainwright. No one else, no one else got up there and said, Mark Seavers hired Wayne and, and hired Jimmy Ray Rogers to murder his wife. Your Honor, the state's evidence is not actually inconsistent with a, um, a reasonable theory of innocence. Uh, and, and judge the reasonable theory of innocence is, is that this is something that Mr. Wright took upon himself and possibly, possibly his wife, who, as we know, had a prepaid phone. And, Your Honor, it would stand to reason that if Miss Wright 
has a prepaid phone for no purpose that is inconsistent with lawful behavior, then that same, that same reasoning would also apply to Mr. Sievers. There were, there was never going to be any forensic evidence linking Mr. Sievers to the, the death of Dr. Teresa Sievers. Uh, it was well established that um, Mark Sievers was in New York and Connecticut at the time of this murder. In fact, it was so well established that it, we did, weren't even required to file a notice of alibi. This, I mean, this was simply the evidence. Um, Your Honor, I would again urge the court to grant judgment of acquittal for the aforestated reasons, uh, both on the conspiracy and, and under both theories of judgment of acquittal that I mentioned for the uh, conspiracy, for the um, insufficiency of the indictment, um, and also, Your Honor, for uh, first degree murder. Thank you. State. Thank you, Your Honor. As the court is aware, at a motion for judgment of acquittal, the court must regard all facts that have been introduced in evidence as admitted by the defendant and must indulge every reasonable inference to the state. Um, it should not be granted unless there is no view of the evidence. And in fact, there is direct evidence in this case. It is not a circumstantial case. The case law clearly supports that. In fact, Looney versus State at 803 Southern 2nd, 656, a Florida Supreme Court case out of 2001, says that a co-defendant's testimony is direct evidence. As the court knows, direct evidence is evidence that requires only the inference that what the witness said is true in order to support a material fact. Curtis Wayne Wright testified that this was a conspiracy. It involved Mark Seavers. He brought in Jimmy Ray Rogers to it. And upon Jimmy Ray Rogers agreeing to be a part of this, then ended up proceeding and buying the actual uh, prepaid burner phone in which he and Mark Seavers commenced their communication. So there is substantial evidence. It is direct evidence. This is not a case that's under a circumstantial evidence uh, standard of law. As to the conspiracy count, it is sufficient in this case um, to establish that there was the agreement. And what I want to point out to the court is, and I think this is a, there's a Newcom case that's just recently come out. Um, it's N-E-W-C-O-M-B versus State. It's a 2009 Westlaw 4249634. It cites within it some other cases, including Vasquez versus State, which is at 111 Southern 3rd, 2007, uh, 273, not 2000. 111 Southern 3rd, 273 out of the second DCA in 2013. And it says that a defendant may be found guilty of conspiracy if he had knowledge of the essential objective and voluntarily became a part of it, even if he lacked knowledge of all the details of the conspiracy or played only a minor role in the total operation. And when we talk about Jimmy Ray Rogers, it is clear he was, through the state's evidence that has been presented, that he played some role. We can call it minor, we can call it major, but it does not matter in order to meet the standard for motion of judgment of acquittal. The state has produced the um, evidence necessary. And you know, we can look further to what the indictment says, Your Honor, to the conspiracy count, as well as the jury instruction. The indictment says, unlawfully agree, conspire, combine, or confederate with each other and so that the plain language that was presented in the indictment is not that all three must be in a cluster talking, but that all three must have participated in this conspiracy. And as the court is aware, 
aware conspiracies can be a group, conspiracies can be a line where one person uh, becomes the middle person in, an, in a conspiracy. And as the jury instruction for criminal conspiracy states in 5.3, uh, an agreement, conspiracy, combination, or confederation to commit murder may be expressed in any particular words. It is not, let me read it precisely, Your Honor. It is not necessary that the agreement, conspiracy, combination, or confederation to commit murder be expressed in any particular words or that words pass or that words pass between the co-conspirators. And I want to emphasize that last part, or that words pass between the co-conspirators. And that is part of the jury instruction that has been approved by the Florida Supreme Court, which the court would read in this case. It is not necessary that Jimmy Ray Rogers and Mark Sievers ever had conversation in order to be co-conspirators. It is not necessary for the state to prove that they had conversations for them to be co-conspirators. So the state has met its burden for the motion of judgment of acquittal, and the state asked the court to deny defense motion. May I respond briefly, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Your Honor, one of the defining features of the American system of justice is notice. We must give notice before every hearing. In a civil complaint, we have to uh, allege with specificity what is being um, what is being sought, what type of relief is being sought. And in a criminal case, we must allege what the the elements of the the charges are, and the state must prove every material fact contained in their indictment or information. They pled it. They pled it as Jimmy Ray Rogers and Curtis Wainwright, and Mark Sievers, and, not and or. That is what they pled. That is how we were noticed. Given that that was our notice, Judge, they can't come back now and say, well, that's not really what we meant. It doesn't matter what they meant. It matters what they wrote down, and it matters what's on the indictment. And what's on the indictment is completely pled in the conjunctive. And given that it was pled in the conjunctive, the state has then imposed a burden upon itself to prove that. And so I think we're, we're getting into a discrepancy between what, what may be, what may be um, the, the burden if it were pled differently and how this case was pled before Your Honor. And the way it was pled before Your Honor, Your Honor, was completely, again, in the conjunctive. And accordingly, Your Honor, irrespective of what is contained in the jury instructions, irrespective of what happened in some other case, which, by the way, we don't know what that indict indictment looked like, and we don't know if this issue was raised in that case. In this case, with this defendant, what was presented is wholly insufficient to support a prima facie case of guilt against Mr. Sievers and that he did not conspire with Curtis Wainwright and Jimmy Ray Rogers if everything that came from that witness box is true. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. As far as the... Uh it, it is a direct evidence case because of the co-defendant, and it's to the jury to decide what weight to give that, if any, and to disregard it or to accept it all. That's in their hands. As far as the conspiracy goes, there's certain charges that are different than others. I would agree with defense counsel if this were a straight-up battery or something else, and it was and, 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 and then it would, the state would have the burden of doing all three. Uh, however, in a conspiracy, all the conspirators don't even need to communicate with each other directly in order to be a part of the conspiracy. I think it's been pled appropriately. I think in the light most favorable to the state, they've met their burden. I'm going to deny your judgment of acquittal on both counts at this time. How many witnesses do you have, defense? Roughly five, you said? Uh, five to seven, Judge. Have any of them, any of them here today? No, we have none of them here today. Okay. Uh, and, Your Honor, 
<coughs> we need to be on the record for this. If we are, that's fine. Um, I I anticipate that most of my most of my witnesses, if not all of my witnesses, are going to be recalled, and the purpose of these recalls is merely to lay a foundation to get items uh, into evidence that, of course, I couldn't present in the state's case in chief. I candidly expect these witnesses to go by relatively quickly. Um, the, the state has asked me um, to take the, the deposition of one, of one of my substantive witnesses um, that we are going to either try to do tonight or some other time. What's that? Not available tonight, so it would have to be tomorrow morning, maybe before court. I'm sorry, we did not say that. Okay. Tomorrow morning before court. Which witness? They have listed a Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S, a Miss Lyons, who is an attorney. Okay. Um, you guys were going to talk about some of your witnesses, I believe, and see if you could stipulate the items as well. Have you guys done that or no? I, we did talk, I mean, we did speak about, uh, we had that one we talked about before the lunch break, Your Honor. We have not spoken about any others. Well, I would encourage you to uh, talk about that tonight then when we adjourn, if you can, because if you can come to an agreement and... We can just introduce, introduce these into evidence without a witness if you guys agree, and that's fine. And if not, of course, we'll go through the process. Um, again, I think you said you already talked to your client. I talked to him again. I'll make inquiry. I'm assuming if he's called, it'll be at the end. Yes, that would be, that would be correct, Your Honor. When we get to the end of your uh, initial witnesses, I'll make an inquiry then. We'll take a, a recess. I would imagine that the earliest then that would be probably after lunch tomorrow. Yes, I I, I do believe that Ms. Lyons' uh, testimony is, is going to it's going to take a while. Um, I, I anticipate just um, it's it's going to be pretty technical as far as uh, life insurance trust documents, um, those those type of issues, um, and I think that it's probably going to require a good amount of explanation to, to the jury. Okay. So I, 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 I'm not going to make any, um, a, any affirmations about how long uh, Ms. Lyons' testimony is, is going to take. How long is your, how long is the deposition going to take? I was thinking it was going to be a relatively brief deposition, but Your Honor, if, if counsel's talking about long testimony and lots of documents, perhaps the deposition will be a little longer than I thought, but I cannot imagine needing more, any more than 30 minutes, Your Honor, in the deposition, and it, I had not planned to need that long. Well, I, I, think, I think the state attorney's office has probably a better baseline uh, understanding of uh, the probate code and, and trusts than, um, than the jury, just as, just as they had to give a uh, fiber uh, primer and, and DNA primer, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to not do the Socratic method, but uh, give a little law school 101 as far as uh, what a trust is, how trusts are administered, uh, so that we're all on the same page when we're talking about um, trusts and, and what they do and, and the people involved. Your Honor, if I could, is she, available? is she available tomorrow morning at eight o'clock? Your Honor, perhaps with the if if with the court's indulgence, if we might take her deposition tomorrow morning, starting at eight, and maybe uh, resume court at nine o'clock. That's exactly what I was thinking. So we're on the same page. Okay. Why don't we bring the jur, jur, jury back out? Uh, I'll release them to tomorrow at nine. I'll be here at eight thirty in case you guys are done or there's any issues. And um, we'll go from there. Bring them out. Please be seated. I'll ask our jurors again, did you uh, follow my instructions, not talk about the case among <laughs> yourselves with anybody else or look up any of the people or places involved, even if you did so inadvertently? I was going to get to that after I finished my spiel. That's all right.
Have you guys all followed my instructions? Okay. I figured, but I was already in knee deep. I figured I'd finish with R11. <laughs> Please be seated. Sir, have you followed my instructions, not talked about the case with anybody else or looked up any of the people or places involved? Excellent. So I brought you all back in to tell you I'm going to let you go for the night. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, again, I'll instruct you not to talk about the case among yourselves or with anybody else or look up the, any of the people or places involved, even though the state is rested. I'll have you all come back tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and we'll start with the defense. See you then. Please be seated. We have a room back there open for you guys to do your deposition. Do we? I'm asking. I don't know. Cause, I thought you were telling me. You're no, I'm asking because I know people are camped out in those rooms back there. So, uh, you know, it may be. There is? Okay. We're good. You can do the deposition in the back. Anything else before we adjourn for the day? State? Not that I'm aware. No, you're on. Defense? Okay, 8 o'clock for all of you. I'll be here at 8.30, and we'll see our jurors at 9.